Good afternoon. Welcome to our uh, October meeting for Mended Hearts. We have a great speaker today, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Karen Bertozzi to introduce our very special speaker today. Go ahead, Karen. So I decided to do a little bit more of an informal introduction of my, um, my cardiologist, my electrophysiologist, and my friend, Dr. Edward Teeley. Um, I think a lot of you read the email promos that went out. He was recently nominated for cardiologist of the year um, through Mended Hearts. And um, he's just, he's a great physician. He has walked with me side by side. I actually have my seven year anniversary on Saturday for my emerging, uh, emergent open heart surgery. Um, and, and just to share a little nugget of, uh, my journey with that and with Dr. Healy, I remember very distinctly on, it was Halloween. It was, uh, I was still in the ICU post-op. I was there, this was like my second week. And Dr. Healy, who's my electrician, along with my plumber, right? A lot of us heart patients have um, electricians and plumbers. They both came in and they had a solution for my uh, junctional rhythm, and my crazy pacing, and none of it was being affected by high amounts of amiodarone. We had done several cardioversions, nothing had worked. So on Halloween, they came in and they said, we have a solution, we'll give you a pacemaker. But it, he very sensitively phrased it, and I don't know if you remember this or not, Dr. Healy, but you were very worried about there being a scar, right? And I wanted to lift up my gown because I had all kinds of scars, right? After being through open heart surgery. So I always found that pretty, pretty funny. Um, anyway, like I said, he's a great physician. He's a great teacher. I've learned so much from him. Um, he's just a good guy. He has an amazing bedside manner. And Dr. Healy, just so you know, you have a pretty decent cross-section of heart patients here. You have people from Israel. You have people from Richmond. You have people with pacemakers, even apart from myself. You have people that are star yoga students in the cardiac yoga program. You have um, people that have... Uh, been through some congestive heart failure. You have some aneurysm people here. So you really have a nice cross section of patients for you. So welcome, we're thrilled. I'm thrilled you're here and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Awesome, thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Um, I'm gonna, I have some slides and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it as a slide presentation. So I'll share my screen. Okay, thanks. So uh, who am I and what am I doing here? I'm Edward Healy, I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist with Johns Hopkins Community Physicians. I'm the Chief of Cardiology at Suburban Hospital, and I'm on staff at Sibley as well. And I'm gonna be talking about atrial fibrillation. I won't go into any specifics on individual patients, of course, um, but just sort of in general. But if people have you know, specific questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, just I'm gonna do my due diligence here and ask you know, my public service announcement, everybody should get vaccinated for COVID-19. Um, and a lot of my patients are getting booster shots. I actually got my booster shot on Friday. I do get a lot of questions from cardiac patients if it is safe for them to get the vaccine. Uh, and my answer is always the same. It is definitely safer to get the vaccine than to be unvaccinated. And we should all continue to take reasonable precautions. So this is the heart, the human heart um, has four chambers, two on the right, two on the left, two upper and two lower. Uh, and our heartbeats normally should originate in the right atrium, the right upper chamber of the heart, spread out through the left and right atrium, regroup at the AV node, oh. the electrical connection between the atrium and the ventricle and then spread down into the ventricles. And that's what gives our heart its rate and rhythm is the electrical system of the heart. So a lot of times we think of the heart as being uh, a pump. Uh, we think of it as having plumbing, but really uh, what makes the heart go is electricity. And the heart can, generates its own electricity. That's one of the characteristics of heart cells. We may come back to this picture again in a little bit. So I'm gonna give some useful medical terms. The atria are the so-called upper chambers of the heart, left and right. The ventricles are the lower or pumping chambers of the heart, left and right. 
An important thing is to distinguish between the heart rate and the heart rhythm. The heart rate is the number of times the heart beats per minute. So it's something like 60 beats per minute, 80 beats per minute. Whereas the rhythm is the electrical sequence of heart activation. Um, and that's a really important thing to distinguish between rate and rhythm. Um, I think you can um, think of this, if you think of it musically, sometimes it helps. Um, the, the rhythm, it's just like in music, uh, there's a rhythm to it, but the rhythm is separated from the rate. And the same song could be played fast or slow. The pulse is the rhythmic throbbing of arteries. That's what you can check in your neck or in your wrist. And that's produced by the beating of the left ventricle. And normally the pulse and the heart rate are the same. Bradycardia is a slow heart rate. Tachycardia is a fast heart rate. Sinus rhythm is the normal rhythm of the heart originating from the sinus node in the right atrium. And arrhythmias or dysrhythmias are abnormal heart rhythms. So usually rhythms that are not coming from the sinus node. What is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is an abnormal heart rhythm. It comes from the upper chamber of the heart, so atria, and it produces an irregular, uh, sorry, an irregular heartbeat or pulse. And that's the fibrillation, right? The fibrillation is the irregularity to it. So atrial fibrillation is an irregular heart rhythm coming from the upper chamber of the heart. What are the characteristics of atrial fibrillation? Well, classically, it produces an irregularly irregular pulse. So most of the time when someone's in atrial fibrillation, if you check their pulse or their heart rate, you'll find that there is no pattern to it. And oftentimes the pulse or heart rate will be fast, although that's not necessarily the case. It's often described by patients as feeling like a flip flop. Um, that's that sensation of the irregularity. It gets more common as we get older and becomes much more common as we get over age 65. It's also more common in really anybody who has heart disease. Um, so people who have had prior surgery on their heart, have had prior heart attacks, have cardiomyopathies or heart failure are more disposed to get it. It's often brought on by physiological stress. So surgery, sepsis and breathing problems. And it oftentimes produces symptoms. Besides the feeling of the flip-flop or irregular heartbeat, it can produce shortness of breath in some people and dizziness in some people. Although there are many people who have atrial fibrillation who are completely asymptomatic. Why do we care about atrial fibrillation? Well, it's the most common abnormal heart rhythm. It can produce symptoms. It is one of the leading causes of stroke. And in fact, we know that for patients who come into the hospital having had a stroke, if we look hard enough, we're gonna find atrial fibrillation in about a third of them. Uh, and it can lead to weakened heart muscle and heart failure if it's left uncontrolled. These are some common questions that I get from patients about atrial fibrillation. I'll deal with some of them up front and some of them a little bit later, but is it a fatal condition? No. We do know that people who have atrial fibrillation on average have a shorter life expectancy, at least by a few months, uh, than people who don't have it, but it's not a fatal condition in and of itself. Is it a serious condition? Uh, I guess that depends on what you mean. It's definitely something that should be treated, uh, should be taken seriously and investigated, but the vast majority of my patients who have atrial fibrillation are living their lives the way that they want to. Um, once I have it, will I always have it? Probably. Can it be treated? Absolutely. We have a lot of treatments for atrial fibrillation. Can it be cured? I'm gonna deal with that towards the end. And is it hereditary? Um, and the answer to that is almost always no. There are some rare, cases in which atrial fibrillation is a hereditary condition, a hereditary arrhythmia, but those are very rare cases. How do we treat atrial fibrillation? Well, when we're treating it, there are four things that we look at. First and most importantly is the stroke risk. 
Secondly is the heart rate. We wanna make sure the heart is not too fast or too slow. The heart rhythm, we may try and restore normal rhythm and then we're gonna look for triggers and causes. I'm gonna pause for a second and take a drink. So what are those risk factors for stroke and atrial fibrillation? Heart failure, hypertension, increasing age. So the stroke risk tends to be quite low for people below 65, mildly elevated for people between 65 and 75, and, and more elevated for people over age 50, uh, 75. Diabetes is a risk factor for stroke. Probably the most important one is a prior stroke or transient ischemic attack or mini stroke. A history of vascular disease, carotid, cardiac, aortic, or peripheral. And in some cases, women have a higher stroke risk than men. So one of the things we always wanna think about is stroke risk reduction. Does everyone need stroke risk reduction, everyone who has atrial fibrillation? The answer to that is no, but everyone needs to have their stroke risk assessed. A question I get a lot is, is aspirin an effective therapy? And the answer to that is probably no. Aspirin is probably not particularly effective in reducing the risk of stroke in atrial fibrillation. Although the US guidelines still, do still include aspirin as a therapy, the Europeans have removed it from their guidelines. What about anticoagulation? Anticoagulation is medicines that decrease the body's ability to form blood clots. They are often incorrectly called blood thinners. That's a term I try to avoid using because they don't make the blood any thinner. They don't affect the viscosity. They really are anticoagulants. They affect the body's ability to make clots. Um, does everyone who has atrial fibrillation need anticoagulation? No. And is anticoagulation safe? Um, yes, anticoagulation is generally quite safe. Um, one of the anticoagulant medications, um, Apixaban, which goes by the trade name Eliquis, did a head-to-head -head trial of that medication against aspirin. It was found that Eliquis was much better at reducing the risk of stroke and had the same bleeding risk as aspirin. So it's at least as safe as aspirin. There used to be only one anticoagulant medication available, which is warfarin or Coumadin. Over the last decade or so, maybe even a little bit longer now, multiple medications have come out, such as Eliquis, which is a Pixaban, Zeralto, which is Rivaroxaban, and Pradaxa, which is Dabigatran. Those medications all have um, advantages over Coumadin or warfarin. Uh, warfarin very specifically blocks the body's uptake of vitamin K. And the amount of vitamin K that we take in in our diets is very unpredictable. Uh, and so the dose of warfarin that is needed is unpredictable. And additionally, warfarin is a medicine that has a lot of drug-drug and food-drug interactions. So generally it's recommended that we try and avoid the use of warfarin, except in very specific cases and try and use one of the newer oral anticoagulants. Sometimes that's not possible um, because those medications can be very expensive. It depends on you know, insurance coverage and that kind of thing. But almost all patients who we see now with atrial fibrillation are on one of the newer anticoagulants and not warfarin. There is also a non-pharmacological way to reduce the risk of stroke and that's closing the left atrial appendage. The left atrial appendage is a little part of the left atrium, the left upper chamber of the heart that sort of hangs down from the main body of the atrium. It's a place where when people are in atrial fibrillation, blood tends to pool. And when blood pools and doesn't flow, it forms clots. And we know that the vast majority of clots that cause stroke come from the left atrial appendage. There is a mechanism now that can be used to close the left atrial appendage. It's been compared head to head with warfarin specifically and found to be equivalent to warfarin in reducing the risk of stroke. At this time, it is mostly recommended for patients who because of bleeding risk or prior bleeding episodes cannot take anticoagulant medications. 
Um, and it's not recommended right now for people who can successfully take anticoagulant medications. So the next thing that we look at is the heart rate. And what is the normal heart rate? Um, that's really a moving target. We've always sort of been taught that it's between 60 and 100, but I think that we were always taught that because 60 is one beat a minute and 100 is a nice round number. I think a better way to look at it is that when people are awake and at rest, the normal heart rate is probably between about 50 and 90. It's perfectly normal for people to have heart rates in the 40s and even the 30s when they're asleep at night. And of course, when we exert ourselves, we should be able to raise our heart rate up. Atrial fibrillation tends to make people's heart beat faster than normal sinus rhythm. And so a lot of times we're using medications to try and control the heart rate in atrial fibrillation. What the target heart rate is varies. It's very patient dependent. And generally we do want to get a resting heart rate of less than 100. And often we're aiming for a resting heart rate of less than 90. A question that I get a lot from patients who have been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation is, do I need a pacemaker? And the answer to that is almost always no. Um, pacemakers do not treat or prevent atrial fibrillation. Um, they treat low heart rates or heartbeats that are not traveling the right way through the heart. So the vast majority of people who have atrial fibrillation are not going to need a pacemaker. In terms of heart rhythm, we can describe atrial fibrillation as being paroxysmal, meaning that it comes and goes. So the person may be in atrial fibrillation today, may come out of it on their own tomorrow. Persistent means that the patient isn't coming out of it on their own, and we're gonna try and do something to get them out of it. And permanent means that the patient is always going to be in atrial fibrillation and we're not going to try and get them back out of it. It's not the same as rate control. This is rhythm control, not rate control. We have medications that we can use to try and keep people or get people back into normal rhythm. Some of the most common ones are flecainide, propafenone, and amiodarone. A lot of times we'll do a cardioversion, so patients in atrial fibrillation and after they've been on anticoagulation for a while, we will try and shock their heart back into normal rhythm. We should be about 95% successful in doing that, but we know that if we don't use an antiarrhythmic medication, the vast majority of those patients are gonna go back into atrial fibrillation in the next year. And finally, ablation is an option, and that's where we go into the heart with catheters or wires, and we try and isolate the areas of the heart that atrial fibrillation arises from. And we know from lots of studies that generally atrial fibrillation arises from where the pulmonary veins, so those are the veins that are returning oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart, meet the left atrium. This is a picture that sort of demonstrates that. Again, if you look at the left atrium, you'll see that there are four arrows coming into it. Those are the pulmonary veins bringing that oxygenated blood back into the heart. In the late 1990s, some doctors in Bordeaux, France, figured out that that's where atrial fibrillation was coming from. And they pioneered the technique of trying to electrically isolate those veins to prevent recurrences of atrial fibrillation. Another important thing to think about is the triggers of atrial fibrillation or things that make it more common or more likely. Alcohol intake is a big, a big item on that list. The British often refer to something called holiday heart, where people are on vacation or holiday and are drinking more alcohol than normal and will find that they're having more episodes of atrial fibrillation. There's definitely a strong relationship between alcohol intake and incidence of atrial fibrillation. Caffeine's another story. We used to think that caffeine was a significant culprit in atrial fibrillation, but as the years have gone by, we found that it's really not that uh, big a factor unless people are having excessive caffeine intake. And the one case that I can think of where clearly caffeine was the trigger was a person who had a day job and then was a nighttime DJ and was drinking about 12 cups of coffee a day. He cut that out and his AFib resolved. Um, overactive thyroid, we should always check thyroid function in someone who's newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. That's an important trigger for it. 
Obstructive sleep apnea may be the most common trigger that we find. Um, and tied into that is obesity, right? We know that the higher the body mass index, the more likely someone is to have atrial fibrillation or to get it. In fact, a trial was done in Australia to compare a regimen of exercise and weight loss to medical therapy for prevention of atrial fibrillation. And they found that a strict regimen of exercise and weight loss was as effective in reducing atrial fibrillation as medical therapy. And lung problems. So people with breathing problems, things like emphysema, COPD, much more likely to have atrial fibrillation. Can atrial fibrillation be cured? No, that's always been our answer. We've always sort of thought of it the same way we think of things like diabetes or coronary artery disease. Once someone has atrial fibrillation, even if they've been in normal rhythm for years, we always feel like they still have atrial fibrillation or the potential to go back into it. Some people would say, yes, we can cure it with ablation. Um, and I think we're sort of settling down into an answer of yes, it can be cured, but rarely. Um, atrial fibrillation ablation has been around for just about 20 years. It's really been widely used for at least a decade. So we don't have that much long-term data on it, but we do know that there is a fairly high recurrence rate years out from, uh, from the ablation. So it's hard to say if we definitely have cured someone of atrial fibrillation. I think if we believe we cured someone and we're gonna stop anticoagulation for stroke risk reduction, we wanna monitor the patients very carefully to make sure there's no recurrence. Fortunately, that is becoming much easier to do in our plugged in world. There are all sorts of ways that we can monitor patients for atrial fibrillation. Um, patients who have pacemakers and defibrillators are essentially being monitored for atrial fibrillation, whether they know it or not. In some patients, especially patients who have had stroke, where we have a high suspicion of atrial fibrillation, we may use an implantable monitor to look for that. There are also then wearables or things that patients can have on their own to monitor for it. I have a smart watch that checks me for atrial fibrillation. I haven't had any yet, thankfully. Uh, there's some very effective smartphone apps that can be used to monitor or look for atrial fibrillation. And on the scale of easy and inexpensive, pulse oximeters, which cost like $20, can be very effective in looking at least for fast heart rates in atrial fibrillation, but sometimes as well for irregularity, which is a marker for atrial fibrillation. So we sort of have moved to where as physicians, there's a lot of ways that we can monitor patients for atrial fibrillation. And there's a lot of ways that people can check themselves to see if they're having atrial fibrillation. So a question I get a lot is, well, what can I do to reduce my risk of atrial fibrillation? Or if I have it, to reduce my episodes of atrial fibrillation. And I think number one on that list is maintaining a good body weight. Um, that seems to be a recurring theme in cardiovascular disease, but it's really sort of the best thing that we can do for our hearts. And tied in with that is regular exercise. Um, we do know that actually extreme exercise like marathon running can make atrial fibrillation more common, but consistent moderate exercise is very good at reducing the risk of atrial fibrillation. Controlling hypertension, um, helps to reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation as well as the overall incidence of stroke. Treating sleep apnea, um, either with a something like a CPAP or working on um, weight loss and exercise can reduce the risk of atrial fibrillation and limiting or um, curtailing alcohol intake is a good way to reduce the risk of atrial fibrillation. And I'm gonna end there, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Healy. Uh, Amy, some people have sent questions to me and maybe yes. not to you. And I'm uh, going to go not... ahead and read some of them. I'm going right, to read not the that... questions now. Okay, okay. Helpful. you go and read what you've got. Go ahead. Okay. So some of them uh, looks like um, they have been answered. I see with uh, caffeine that, that got answered. And... Um, alcohol. That was a big question. I'm sure it was in the back of everybody's mind. It does, may not have made it out of their mouths. 
what else? There's a question here also about um, a CRTD device. How do, how can those help in AFib? Um, CRTD devices. So those are um, the D stands for defibrillator, and the CRT stands for cardiac resynchronization therapy. Uh, so that is a device that the defibrillator aspect of it can shock the heart out of abnormal, potentially lethal arrhythmias like ventricular fibrillation. Um, and the CRT part means that it's making the two sides of the heart, the right and left side beat together. Uh, CRT is a therapy for um, heart failure and cardiomyopathy or weakened heart muscle, uh, not really a therapy for atrial fibrillation. There was a defibrillator out 20 or more years ago before, before I was in practice uh, that would shock people out of atrial fibrillation, but we learned that doing that that way was not an effective strategy. Okay, um, so we've had some questions about diet and nutrition um, I, in preventing AFib, but I think probably the bigger factor is if folks are on anticoagulation, how, how could diet and nutrition affect that, if you have any comments on that? So um, that's really a very, um, that's a great question, but I think really that revolves around what we talked about in terms of warfarin or Coumadin versus the newer oral anticoagulants. Um, the newer oral anticoagulants, really there's no restriction on people's diet or no specific recommendations for diet when people are on that. Uh, on the other hand, that is very important for patients who are on warfarin or Coumadin because that is blocking the uptake of vitamin K. And in fact, we can reverse warfarin by giving someone vitamin K. So people who, um, who are on warfarin or Coumadin for stroke risk reduction uh, really need to try and maintain a steady intake of um, vitamin K and not let that alter too much in their day-to-day -day diet. And how would you say um, Coumadin, com would, how would you say, like, would you prefer Coumadin for people or would you prefer the newer anticoagulants that don't require so much upkeep? So the recommendation from the American College of Cardiology and the Heart Rhythm Society is to preferentially choose one of the newer oral anticoagulants over Coumadin or Warfarin. Um, the newer oral anticoagulants are a little bit better than Warfarin at reducing the risk of stroke and have a little bit lower risk of intracranial bleeding, bleeding inside the head. Um, so generally, we try and use the newer oral anticoagulants. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, one is in people who have mechanical heart valves. Um, another is in people who have atrial fibrillation driven by rheumatic valve disease. Um, those patients, warfarin is, is better than the newer oral anticoagulants. Um, and then additionally, you know, there is... Um, there's a, a real issue with insurance. While most people get good coverage for the newer oral anticoagulants through their insurance, uh, if they don't, um, they can really be prohibitively expensive. Yes. Well, being a nurse practitioner and now a hospital administrator, I, I understand that part well. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a question here. Can certain pain medicines cause or, or aggravate atrial fibrillation? Uh, I'm not aware of, of any specific uh, relationship there. Okay. All righty. And I think we had um, one about beer drinking, and I think you did address that alcohol could possibly make that worse. Yeah, I don't know that the mode of alcohol intake matters, whether it's, you know, beer, wine, or whiskey. Um, I don't know. Um, I think really it's just alcohol itself has a direct effect on the atrial myocytes, the cells in the hey. atrium, um, yes. and it makes them more vulnerable to early beats coming in. And those early beats act as the trigger for atrial fibrillation. Okay, that's that's good to know. I, I have a couple of questions to too that came to me. If if you, I'm not you may done. Not have seen. Okay, not I done. don't know. I didn't yeah. see. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Um, another big question. This is one I have, Dr. Healy, um, that has always perplexed me. At what point in treating people do you decide to go to an ablation, knowing, you know, obviously I know how much all those catheters and things cost in those, you know, the cardo versus the enzyme. What point do you make the call, we've got to do an ablation on this person? Well, that's a great question. And again, that is a moving target. Uh, in fact, last year, there was a, a seminal study, which was really the first to show that acting early to treat atrial fibrillation can improve outcomes down the road. Uh, and so, whereas a few years ago, we were generally, I think, regarding ablation as sort of you first tried one antiarrhythmic, then you tried another antiarrhythmic, you might try a third one and then move to ablation. I think now we are much more likely to move to ablation upfront as a first line therapy. Now, that depends though a lot on the patient. Um, so, you know, have we investigated risk factors? In terms of that patient, um, do they have you know do they have sleep apnea? Is it being treated? What's their alcohol intake? Have they been working on diet and exercise? Um, have we looked at the heart with an ultrasound uh, to see if there's any factors inside the heart that we need to deal with, um, like significant valve disease or something like that? And then, um, what is the patient's um, you know age? What is their their BMI? We know that the higher the BMI, the less successful an ablation is going to be. Uh, so really, while we are moving towards uh, ablation earlier, it still is very patient specific. Thank you. Okay, Jeff, I think you have some more questions from, from the crowd. Why don't you go ahead and read off some of yours? Okay, I will. Thank you, Amy. It says, have you seen a rise in AFib with COVID and why don't ablations work is three things that she asked. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, anytime that there is, um, periods of physiological stress, like significant infections, uh, you'll see increased incidence of atrial fibrillation, definitely increased incidence of atrial fibrillation in people who have myocarditis. And we know myocarditis happens very frequently in COVID infections. Um, I'm not seeing as much of that as we were perhaps last, um, spring and fall. Um, we have fewer patients in the hospital with COVID right now. Um, but, you know, any, any infection uh, can definitely increase the incidence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, what are factors for when ablation doesn't work? Well, um, I think um, there's a lot of different, a lot of different factors there. But we do know that uh, again, the higher the body mass index, especially BMIs that are over 33, are going to be less effective in, um, in treating atrial fibrillation. We know that atrial fibrillation usually arises from those four veins returning uh, blood from the lungs, but there are other veins that are also bringing blood back to the heart. There's the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus, which come into the right atrium. And sometimes triggers may be coming from there and not from the pulmonary veins. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of different reasons why an atrial fibrillation ablation might not be successful. We have a question that's probably common between Sam and Brian here, which is about pain meds and can they cause AFib or, or is it true AFib is, ne is never caused specifically by taking any meds? It's related to I, I am not familiar with a, a specific relationship between pain meds and atrial fibrillation. Right. And, and is AFib equally common in children? Uh, atrial fibrillation is very rare in children. Very rare. Um, it's really very rare in people under the age of 30. It is rare in people under the age of 50. Uh, it is very common in people over the age of 85. So um, it's really, you know, it's a, it, the older the population gets, the more atrial fibrillation that you see, but it is extremely rare in children. Except right. for some I, children who have, you know, 
congenital heart disease, right? In children with congenital heart disease, it's common, but there's a very small part of the population. Okay, uh, here's a question, uh, not directly related, of course, to your talk, but still brought out by Mark. Uh, how long, it has to do with the vaccine, may we ask the question, in your opinion? Sure. Okay, how long should it take to reach the maximum protection after getting the Pfizer booster? Also, since flu shot only lasts six months, when is the best time to get it? I've been told not to get two shots simultaneously because if you have a reaction, you won't know which was the culprit. I did get two, by the way, at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and he continues with how long should it take? No, no, that's the same thing. He just did it twice. Uh, yeah, I, I, I admit, I don't know the answer to um, the booster and maximum protection. I, I just don't know that answer. Uh, I know that they are giving um, the flu vaccine and the booster simultaneously in a lot of places right now. I was given that option when I got it the other day. Um, there doesn't seem to be any ill sequelae from doing that. Um, you know, people are pe people were saying, well, don't do that because then you don't know which one you've had an adverse reaction to. But if you're getting a booster, you already have gotten a prior COVID vaccine and you've already gotten a flu vaccine in the past. So the likelihood of having a significant idiosyncratic reaction to one of those is going to be pretty low. We did get one more question from Brian related to AFib. He want to know if a low or slow heart rate contribute to AFib. So um, again, that, that depends. Uh, and it really probably depends on the reason for the low heart rate. Um, so um, there can be relationships between arrhythmias, fast arrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, and a baseline slow heart rate. Um, but in general, a slower resting heart rate is good, right? It's better to have a resting heart. That's why I said the real, the real normal heart rate should be 50 to 90, not 60 to 100. People who have a resting heart rate in the 50s are much more likely to be in good cardiovascular health than people with a resting heart rate in the 90 to 100 range. Um, we do know that sometimes slow heart rates at night associated with sleep apnea, uh, we can see more atrial fibrillation in those settings. So again, that's a, it depends on a lot of different factors. Right, I, I would say now that we're at the end of the Q and A period that uh, just a reminder here, we're not looking for, uh, here to give specific medical advice, that's for sure. But Thank you know, you, I open the, I would, I'd say, Amy, if you agree, just open the floor if anybody wants to ask yeah. a question or show their video, et cetera, et cetera. Best scene sure. gallery view if you switch guys. So I have another question, Dr. Healy. So what is new, what's new on the horizon? What has you excited to be, you know, as an electrophysiologist? Treatment wise, um, for atrial fibrillation or just in general? For AFib, it's a huge problem in this yeah. country. <laughs> uh, I think the recent data on the effectiveness of a strategy of ablation upfront, um, I, I think that that is really um, the first really significant change in our therapy uh, that we've had mm -hmm. since the introduction of um, atrial fibrillation ablation as, as something we can do. Uh, and I think that's gonna really change our practice over the next few years. Uh, I also think that the, um, pro, you know, we're gonna see more use of um, devices to close the left atrial appendage, which will help get patients off of anticoagulation, which I think will make people uh, happy. Um, Right now, that's really for a very targeted population, but I think we're gonna see that expand over the next few years. Okay. Let's see, we have a couple others here. I think, um, so we have a big question here. A recap of the symptoms of AFib. I think that that's a pretty long list. <laughs> yeah. I think that the major symptom that people feel is an irregular feeling, a flip-flop feeling of their heart. Um, that's probably the number one symptom. Uh, certainly people can develop shortness of breath, especially with exertion. 
Um, and some people do develop feelings of lightheadedness with it. Now, those are pretty generic symptoms. Uh, there really is no one thing that is um, super specific to atrial fibrillation, other than that flip-flop feeling um, that lasts a while. So in other words, it's not a one-off. Like I'm sitting there, I feel that happen once, it doesn't happen again. But a sustained feeling of that is really the sim symptom that is most closely associated with atrial fibrillation. And how about when you're trying to diagnose somebody with these symptoms? How, how long does it take? How difficult can it be? <laughs> it can sometimes be super easy and sometimes really difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends, uh, right? You really want to capture the irregular heart rhythm. Um, and sometimes it's as easy as having the patient come in and getting an EKG. Sometimes we're hunting hard. Um, we have people wear monitors for a couple of weeks. Um, but that's why we use things like the implantable loop recorder that can monitor someone's heart rhythm for up to three years and look for that. Um, I am, if I'm suspicious of atrial fibrillation and we haven't turned it up, I'll really encourage my patients to get a smartwatch or a smartphone app to look for it as well. Okay. Right. And then I think we see, oh, I see there's a question of a flip flop um that's more like a fluttering in your heart like if you feel fluttering i've heard people describe it all kinds of ways how about you dr haley I've, I've heard it described all different kinds of ways yeah and i think i saw one more question here from gil let's see i think he asked something about like having a mechanical valve like does that increase your chances of possibly having, and previous strokes, having to increase any your chances of having AFib? So any, any prior heart surgery increases your likelihood of having atrial fibrillation. Yeah. And although having a stroke doesn't increase your likelihood of having atrial fibrillation, it means that it's more likely that you have atrial fibrillation, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, um, because we know that atrial fibrillation is a significant risk factor for stroke. Great. Thank you. Folks, any other questions? Don't be shy. You can unmute yourself if you want to ask. Go ahead, Ash, unmute yourself. I have a question. Doctor, I am taking warfarin. Should I be cautious? Taking warfarin, it was recommended by my cardiologist. Um, I think Coumadin has been used successfully for a very long period of time. Okay. And as long as you are having your Coumadin levels monitored, it's okay. a safe thing to use. Also, do, what are the newer Coumadins you are talking about? So there are the newer oral anticoagulants, and those are things like Eliquis, Pradaxa, Zeralto that work in a different mechanism. Um, and so they don't have to be monitored the way that warfarin has to be monitored. Now, again, it depends on the exact scenario, uh, what the right medication to use is for each individual patient. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, folks? Yes, um, I just kind of joined in a little late, sorry. Um, That's okay. Name's Cliff Thompson. I've actually um, have had two open heart surgeries, two mitral valve replacements done, one at 40 years of age, one at 50 years of age. Um, I have had a number of episodes of AFib since that. It seems to be kind of part of the package for me. Um, I'm currently on Eliquis and question I have, is there anything short of um, another, um, not cardioversion, but a, um, I can't even think of the procedure. Um, you know, they, they burn leads on my heart three different times now. Is there another option? I, I think that naturally that can be done. Uh, I, I don't said? Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's a question that I can answer. I, I think that's something, you know, that's a complicated scenario and someone would really have to have an in-depth 
knowledge of your your past medical records to know the answer to that. Just to set the record straight, doctor. Um, hi, my name is Gail. I'm from Israel. I had two strokes. None of them were anything to do with AFib. Yeah, right. So the, the majority of people who have strokes, you know, don't have AFib, but it is a significant risk factor for strokes. Oh, okay. Question. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Doc. Um, so um, AFib is not always related, doesn't always, um, if you have a stroke, I guess AFib is not always a factor and doesn't affect the heart, correct? So my question is, um, I'm a heart recipient. And my donor had, um, my late donor had um, a stroke, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the heart that I have has experienced AFib before. Correct. It does not necessarily mean that. Absolutely. Okay. So, so my risk factors are not just that, but, but you said, you know, if you have any heart surgeries, uh, you could be um, exposed, you could have more risk for getting AFib and also the other factors that you listed with weight and all that stuff, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Amy. Awesome. Okay. Well, we had, we certainly had a lot of great questions and um, anyone Amy. else, anyone Amy. else? Oh, go Amy. ahead, Ash. Hey, doctor, this is not a question. It's a compliment to you. Very nice informative message passed on to everybody. Definitely. Yep. Very, you. very, very nice message. Very simple to understand. It's a compliment to you, doctor. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Hay. Okay. If we have no more questions, then we are going to go ahead and wrap up till next month. We will get our announcements out. We will see if we can uh, get another speaker. If not, we'll have our regular support group meeting. And uh, Dr. Healy, once again, we thank you very, very much. Great. And Thanks everyone, for having me. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.